Hello, once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. Going to do another video today talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. Let's go to prayer first. Heavenly Father, I ask you that you would bless this video and use it to reach the people who are asleep and the lost. Open people's eyes to the signs that you are showing them every day. And please get this message to people who still have ears to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Guys, we are running out of time. If you, if you still are on the fence and don't know whether we are really in the last days or not, or... If you're not a believer, if you're not sure, if you're not sure that you're ready to make that commitment, it is time. We are out of time. And I, and I just I can't stress that enough. I have, again, more news stories today just showing you how we're right on the brink. But uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just incredible to me what's going on. And it's incredible to me how asleep and indifferent most people are. And no matter what it seems like, they just won't open their eyes to the signs. They just want to deny and mock. But I'm trusting God to open people's eyes while there's still time. But there's a very big danger when you mock and scoff and when you continually reject the truth of God's Word and salvation through Jesus Christ. And I want to go into a little bit of scripture about that first. And then we'll get into some news stories. Um, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 15 says, uh, While it is said, Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. People in America have had unlimited access to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the word and to the Bible. And they still are just so uninformed and, and think that they're Christians just because they were raised in church or because they're American. Because they're a good person. Because they have a knowledge of the Jesus, of who Jesus was. But they're not really Christians. And the more you, 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 it's the more that you reject the gospel the harder your heart becomes. And we're in the last days. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, it says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. And, and that is exactly where we're at. And people are just growing colder and colder to the truth of the gospel. And buying into the lies of the politically correct, ecumenical, peace and harmony uh, one world religion, one world government that's that's forming right before your very eyes that will be a government and a religion that's going to ultimately take away all of your rights and eventually will actually result in the beheading of anybody that will not accept the mark of worshiping the final world leader. And you will not be able to buy or sell without his mark. And we are heading so fast to that day. The technology is here for it. They're testing it all around the world. People already have implants in their hand to store digital currency to pay for things. we got this net neutrality thing where you know, Obama's wanting to take over the Internet. And, and, and <laughs> you know, again, the world, one world government is going to require supercomputers to, and the control of the Internet, control of the people, and that's exactly what they're setting up. I want to go to Second Thessalonians. I've, I've done a, a complete video about this chapter, um, but I want to go over it again briefly because it's so important to what I'm talking about right now, about not hardening your heart, not rejecting the truth right now. Because God is going to send a strong delusion to fool every single person who's rejected the truth. And you will not escape that. You are not smarter than God. You will not be able to outwit God when he sends a delusion to fool you. 
So let, let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13, because this is a huge, very important chapter in Bible prophecy, and one that I believe is very misunderstood and mistaught. So I'm going to run through some th several things here real quick, and then we're going to get into some new stories. So Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, be beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the very beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, there are, there are so many people out there proclaiming the truth of God's word and the, and the signs of the times that we're living in. And that's why they're going to shut the internet down. Because right now, I'm telling you, the internet church is growing. The regular church, not so much. The internet church is strong. And there are people proclaiming the signs of the times, the soon return of Jesus Christ, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But people are rejecting it, and they will believe the lie. And uh, so again, I'm going to give you some encouragement real quick. Uh, verse 2 says, Do not be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, that, that, day, that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is not the rapture. The rapture is referred to in verse 1, uh, By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Uh, but that day won't happen until, excuse me, that day, that day will happen, and then the day of Christ will be at hand. And that's why Paul wrote to the second the letter of Second Thessalonians, because they were suffering persecution and thought they were already in the day of Christ. And he says, no, don't be soon shaken or troubled, because that day, the day of Christ, the tribulation period, and the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, that cannot happen until there become, a, there become a falling away first and the man of sin, the Antichrist, be revealed. It goes on to talk about the um, the mystery of, a, of iniquity is already at work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And there are so many people out there with some strange ideas of who this he, until he be taken out of the way is. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is the only only one per powerful enough to hold back Satan and his army of demons and their evil agendas. Only Satan can hold that, or excuse me, only the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to hold that back. And the Holy Spirit indwells the church. Now, as I go on here again, again, if you've seen, heard me say this before, t t teach on this before, uh, I hope you'll just listen again because I think it's very, very important. Um, and if you haven't heard this, I pray that you'll listen to this. Or if you have a different idea on this, I pray you. I listen. I pray that you'll pray about this and 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 listen and and, and pay attention to the pronouns that are here and, and that are used in this the rest of this chapter. So uh, Satan will um, be giving the power to the Antichrist here in verse nine, and then it says, "With all deceivableness of unrighteousness, 
in them that perish, again, note that word, them, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That passage there is not talking about the church. The church loved the truth. The truth, the church, the true church does not have pleasure in unrighteousness. The true church loves the truth and the message of God and have been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why in verse 13 it says, But we are bound to give thanks to God for you, brethren, loved of the Lord, because God hath in the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Because the church believed the truth, they have salvation. They have been chosen for salvation. And I, again, I strongly ask that you would pray about this chapter if you are a post-trib person and explain and try to figure out how you and we, when Paul is addressing them and he, he says you and we, and then says they and them, how that could be the same people. It can't be and, that's, and it's not. The strong delusion will be sent to people who are left behind when Satan is ruling through the Antichrist. They will believe the lie of the of why the why the people disappear, why um, and and the lies that that the Antichrist will have for the answers for peace and prosperity. It's probably a coming alien uh, deception. Blue, blue, blue beam type technology simulating a rapture to try to explain away the rapture. Not to try to fool Christians into thinking that there was a rapture that they missed. That is not the agenda of the new world order like so many people like to teach. They're, 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 what they need to do is, is get the people to understand and fall into, into place with their agenda after the rapture, and they're going to have to find a way to explain it away. And there will be a strong delusion. And if you aren't willing to stand for Jesus Christ right now, when it's pretty easy, unless you live in the Middle East, if you live in the United States, it's pretty easy to stand for Jesus Christ right now. It's getting tougher, but it's not near. It's not like most places. But if you won't stand for him now because somebody will make fun of you, or you might, you might offend somebody. They, they might, you know, might not want to be friends with you anymore because you believe the Bible. Do you really think you're going to stand for Him when it means getting your head cut off? It is time to come to Jesus Christ now while you still can. The rapture is real. The rapture is is imminent. It's our blessed hope. Titus two thirteen. The glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter three verse ten letter to the church of philadelphia the church has promised because you have kept the word of my patience i also will keep thee from the hour that's a time period of temptation should go upon all the world to try them to dwell upon the earth and again the last thing i want to say about this look into all the times that the phrase dwelling upon the earth whether it be luke 21 whether it be in revelation uh and notice it's never talking about believers. It's never talking about the church. It's talking about people who live on the earth during the reign of the Antichrist after the church age. Which again explains Revelation 3.10. It is our blessed hope, and I'm going to stand behind that until the trumpet sounds. And again, all of you who say we... Pre-tribbers don't believe in persecution. Of course there's persecution. There always has been. And if Daniel's 70th week does not start soon, persecution could come into America and we could face death for our faith. But it will not be during Daniel's 70th week because it's Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble. The church age is over. But yes, we all need to be ready to defend our faith and stand up for Jesus Christ regardless of the consequences. 
But there is a blessed hope, and Jesus Christ is coming for his church. And all the signs are here. And if you continue to re reject the gospel, you will believe the lie. I, I encourage all of you, if you are not saved, to really turn to Jesus Christ in faith right now. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. And I'm telling you, the signs are moving along so fast, and it's just getting... Uh, <laughs> It's crazy. I'm telling you, 2015 is going to be a year like never before. And, uh, <laughs> need to keep looking up. So, let's get into some news stories. Real quickly, I just want to give a couple of quotes from the last couple of days from our government officials. Somehow, John Kerry said this yesterday in a congressional hearing. Uh, we are living in a period of less daily threat to Americans. That's a quote by our Secretary of Defense, John Kerry. What America and what world is he living in? And if he can stand here and say that, as yesterday they supposedly arrested three ISIS members in New York. Um, <laughs> we are living in a period of less daily threat to Americans. Wow. But let's, let's see what James Clapper said today. James Clapp Clapper is the Director of National Intelligence. He said 2014 is the deadliest year for global terror in the past 45 years. Both people from, from the same government administration, completely different opinions. But I can assure you the message that Barack Hussein Obama, John Kerry, Joe Biden, Susan Rice are telling you is not the truth. The, the lies that about what's going on in this world that Barack Obama said in his State of the Union address were, it were just incredible. The economy is not what he says. The threat of global war and Iran getting a nuclear weapon and, and, and the threats to Israel are real. Russia and Ukraine. There are so many issues going on. Time is so short. So, having said that, let's get into, into some more news stories. Um, this first one is kind of just an interesting news story. It came out of uh, Ynet News today. Israel, Jordan, and the PA sign historic Red Sea, Dead Sea Canal deal. Overcoming political obstacles, Israel, Jordan, the Palestinian Authority signed what Energy Minister... Sylvan Shalom called historic agreement securing an additional 100 million meter, meter uh, excuse me 100 million metric cubes of water supplies for residents of Israel, West Bank, and the Jordan. And Jordan in a, in a ceremony ceremony held in Washington headquarters of the World Bank on Monday, Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority will sign an agreement green lighting the construction of Red Sea Dead Sea pipeline. The Red Sea Dead Sea conduit, also known as the Two Seas Canal, will carry some 100 million metric cubes of water to the north annually. As part of the cooperation, the Joint Water Purification Plant will be formed and Israelis, Jordanians, and Palestinians will share the water. Uh, so this is a, an, a, an historic agreement, adding it was a dream come true. Um, it goes on and gives you some more details of the of the agreement. But a um, couple things. One, again, I'm going to put, post all these links to all these articles in the description box. And you have to look at it yourself. But um, okay, so here's a as a deal being signed between Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian. It's, I know, I understand it's just for water, but keep in mind a couple of very important things. Israel and Jordan have a peace treaty already. It's been in place for 25 years. Jordan controls the Temple Mount. King Abdullah of Jordan has uh, recently been much more involved in the war against ISIS. He's been involved in in uh, discussions with John Kerry, Mahmoud Abbas, and Benjamin Netanyahu over the Temple Mount. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's the first part of that verse. There will be a temple built in Israel, in Jerusalem, for the final seven-year period of time. And the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many, which will allow that to happen. 
confirm a covenant does not necessarily mean sign a new treaty. There is a treaty with Israel now. Could that treaty be modified? Could he reconfirm it with the Palestinians and 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 the world in general? With all the Muslim, the the moderate Muslim, so-called moderate Muslim nations, that there's 57 Arab states. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm going to put a link into this description box about the uh, the background of, of King Abdul. I've done a few other videos about him, but he's a, he's a guy that we really need to keep our eye on here in these last days. And and uh, but I'm going to put a link to his background in there for you. Check it out. It's very, very interesting. But here's a here's a here's a deal that was just made between Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinians, and uh, King Abdullah is getting involved in a lot of things, and and uh, it's just very very interesting to see what happens. I know that's just a water deal. I'm not saying this is a covenant, but it just the the players are getting in place, and any type of covenant between these these three is is an interesting thing. Um, could it lead to further covenants? So that's all I'm saying. All right, um, let's move on. A lot of other news stories, some very interesting news stories today. Um, let's go to the next one. Historic speech. This is a really long article. I'm just going to try to highlight some of this one. Historic speech and a dangerous gamble. Uh, this is um, out of the Times of Israel today. Again, talking about the speech Benjamin Netanyahu is going to make. Um, I'm going to try to summarize this because it is pretty long. Netanyahu will become the second statesman in history to address Congress three times. He wants to avert a nuclear Iran, but will his likely defiance of Obama actually make a deal more likely? And, and I have to say yes. <laughs> Quite frankly, I, I, I would agree with that, that Obama is, is dead set on getting this deal regardless, and he does not care what Benjamin Netanyahu says, and the way Obama tends to act, yes, I believe wholeheartedly that he will do it just because he's upset at Netanyahu. But let's move on. It says, the rule must act to prevent Iran's nuclearization since the deadline for attaining this goal is getting extremely close. That quote is from Benjamin Netanyahu when he addressed Congress on July 10th, 1996. Talking about Iran being close to a nuclear, a goal of getting nuclear weapons all the way back in 1996. Fifteen years later, in the spring of 2011, Netanyahu addressed the same form a second time. When I, stood, when I last stood here, I spoke of the consequences of Iran developing nuclear weapons, he recalled. Now time is running out. The hinge of history may so soon turn, for the greatest danger of all could soon be upon us, a militant Islamic regime armed with nuclear weapons. That was back in 2011. This Tuesday, Netanyahu plans to take the podium a third time. Um, says that he will be the uh, second person in history um, to uh, re re to do this hat trick of speaking to Congress a third time. Um, the other ones were Kayim Herzog and. Um, Excuse me, Nelson Mandela and Yitzhak Yurbin also did it twice. So he'll be the first one to do it three times. All right, so let's go on. Um, <clears throat> so some commentators have argued that Netanyahu must speak before Congress a third time. Uh, the rift is causing with the U.S., no, regardless of the rift it's causing with the U.S., because he is the Churchill of our time. Like the British pre-war leader in the 1930s, Netanyahu has been sounding the alarm about Iran's ominous nuclear and terrorist th threats and activities. Um, Congress needs to hear... Uh, this, is a, this is a quote from Steve Forbes. Congress needs to hear firsthand the truth about what Iran, Iran is doing and the dreadful implications of those activities. Um... The agreement that is being formulated between Iran and major powers is dangerous for Israel, and therefore I will go to the U.S. next week in order to explain to the American Congress, uh, which could influence the fate of the agreement, um, and that's why this agreement is dangerous for Israel, the region, and the entire world. The goal is clear. Persu persuade the legislators 
to quickly pass a law that could call, call for more sanctions on Iran. His aides refused to say this week that the Prime Minister will actively encourage Congress to legislate additional sanctions, but merely that he will outline what a good deal would look like and stress that a bad deal needs to be prevented at all costs. The Israeli leader um, remains determined to try. Now I can guarantee that my speech in Congress will prevent a danger. Now can I guarantee that a, my speech in Congress will prevent a dangerous deal with Iran from being signed? Honestly, I don't know. No one knows, he admitted last week. But I do know this. It is my sacred duty as Prime Minister of Israel to make Israel's case. Um, It says the, the speech will fall on partisan ears. The Republicans will agree. Democrats will disagree. All this is turning Israel into a polarizing issue as well. Obama can veto the sanctions bill. He said he will veto it. Therefore, we cannot expect any change in U.S. policy from this speech. Netanyahu could argue that by getting lawmakers to legislate more sanctions, he indirectly provides the president with more leverage in the negotiations with, the, with Iran. Congress isn't happy with the current terms of the deal. Obama could tell the Iranians, therefore you will have to compromise a bit to make me this sell at home. Uh, let me scroll down. Uh, it says, uh, but Netanyahu's st strategy to prevent the agreement by giving a defiant speech in Congress would also seem deficient. It might not only provide ineffect it might not only prove ineffective in thwarting the deal, but could also antagonize the government of Israel's closest and most powerful ally for years to come. And again, like I did in my video last night, if we uh, end our relationship with the, with Israel over this, America is done. It, it's over. Um, and you know, in the whole scheme of things, this whole article, really, the reality, if you ask me, the whole point is moot anyway. It's a moot point because, um, one, they're going to get a bomb. And if they don't, their allies, Russia, North Korea, and China, will give them one or use theirs against uh, Israel anyway. When push comes to shove. So let's let's go to uh, another scripture. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the, people, the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That's Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. A perfect example or depiction of a nuclear detonation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. Revelation 6, 8. And I looked and behold, behold a pale horse, and his name that set on him was death, and hell followed after him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with the death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, a fourth part of the earth dying. Nuclear war, as well as other judgments from God, could destroy, easily destroy a couple billion people on this planet. And the Bible says it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. Uh, regardless of what happens with this Iranian nuclear deal, there will be nuclear war. Uh, there will be global war like never seen before. Jesus said it's going to get so bad that if he didn't shorten the days, no flesh would be saved. All right, let's move on. Now we know who to believe on Iran. I just want to read this headline. Uh, this is all the Times of Israel today. Uh, it says, Now we know who to believe on Iran. The Obama administration claimed Israel was misrepresenting its deal with the Ayatollahs. Reports from Geneva indicate Israel's concerns were all too accurate. Can you see why Barack Hussein Obama is so against Netanyahu coming here to speak because Netanyahu is going to come tell the truth and it's going to make the Obama administration look really bad not that he really cares because he's put up with that for six years things making him look bad it makes himself look bad but he's so dead set against helping Israel in this cause and uh, again even, even with Netanyahu coming here to speak it's not going to matter but at least the truth is getting out there and people are starting to see the truth alright um Here's another headline. Netanyahu ruled has given up in Iran nuke talks. This is also all the Times of Israel today. 
Prime Minister says negotiators seem to have come to terms with the Islamic Republic capable of producing nuclear weapons. In his sharpest criticism yet, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said world powers have given up on stopping Iran from developing nu nuclear weapons in ongoing negotiations. Netanyahu made the comments Wednesday night at the meeting of his Likud party outside of Jerusalem. Uh, in his remarks, Netanyahu said that the greatest challenge Israel faces is the threat of Iran arming itself with nuclear weapons with the declared goal of annihilating us. From the government that is forming, it appears that they, world powers, have given up on that commitment to thwart Iran and are accepting that Iran will gradually, within a few years, develop capabilities to produce material for many nuclear weapons. They might accept this, but I am not willing to accept this. The West fears Iran may be attempting to build an atomic bomb with its nuclear power. Iran says this program is for peaceful purposes. I respect the White House and, and the U.S. President, but on a serious subject, it's my duty to do everything for Israel's security. Under the agreement that is being prepared, we have reason to worry if the world powers have reached an agreement with Iran, he added. <clears throat> Again, I stand completely behind Benjamin Netanyahu. And I again, I agree with his assessment that the world is pretty much just kind of given up. They're, they're, they're just continuing to allow Iran to work on this nuclear deal, uh, on, on their nuclear program, excuse me, and delay the talks and delay the deals and to hide things. And they know they're hiding things and they're still continuing to let it go on. And again, I have to wonder how much longer is Benjamin Netanyahu going to hold off attacking Iran's nuclear sites himself. And if he will, if he does, will we help him? And if we don't, what's going to happen to America? Oh, <laughs> wow. Um, Kerry, this is interesting too. Just another example of us disrespecting Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, <laughs> John Kerry accuses Netanyahu of cheerleading the 2003 Iraq War. Uh, U.S. diplomat questions Prime Minister's judgment as rift over nuclear talks deepens. I'm not going to go into the background of the 2003 war, um, but he says Netanyahu may have a judgment that just may not be correct here, said Kerry. Well, we know for a fact that is that Iran, excuse me, that Iran is hiding its nuclear program. It's got secret sites. It's continuing to work on nuclear weapons while continuing to focus on the annihilation of Israel. And I don't understand how anybody with a straight face can be part of the Obama administration and sit there and question anybody else's judgment on anything. And that's the scary thing. Those are the guys, <laughs> Kerry and Obama, are the leaders in this deal with the P5 plus one and Russia and all that. The re in fact, I did an article not too long ago about how uh, they've all backed out, and it's pretty much just the United States now in these negotiations. Um, <laughs> but for for us to uh, question Benjamin Netanyahu's judgment on this. And yesterday, Susan Rice coming out and saying that uh, Netanyahu coming here to speak is going to hurt the fabric of our relationship just because they don't want him to come and try to defend his country. God help this nation. <clears throat> All right. Now, here's a, here's a few more news stories I think are very, very interesting. This next one, again, very long. I'm going to do my best to summarize and give you the best information out of it. But uh, Yehuda Glick is, 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 it's not the Eretz Sheva, it says Yehuda Glick is running with the Likud. Surprised? Now that's not the interesting part of the headline. And remember, remember, Yehuda Glick is a Temple activist, Temple Mount activist, who was, they tried to assassinate a few months ago, and he's recovering pretty well. But he sa it says here, don't be, sa don't be, says the indef indefatigable Temple Mount activist as he tells why he's more confident than ever of a Temple Mount resolution. This is Yehuda Glick. It says it's been four months since the veteran Temple Mount activist Yehuda Glick was gunned down in an attempted assassination attempt. Since then, he has astonished doctors with his rapid recovery. Glick has, has proven more determined than ever to achieve his life's mission, equal prayer rights for Jews on the Temple Mount, which, despite being Judaism's holiest site, 
is one of the few places in the world where Jews are forbidden to worship due to Muslim pressure and threats of violence. Um, but the threat, the, it talks about the threats on, the, on Glick's life are still there. Uh, it says, Glick still lives in an undisclosed location and is constantly accompanied by an armed bodyguard provided not by the police, who have been criticized over their unwillingness to adequately, adequately protect Glick, both before and after the attack. The police do, however, provide him with daily updates of intelligence on jihadist chatter concerning him, as well as a direct emergency hotline for him to alert them of any suspicious activity he notices. Islamic Jihad and other terrorist groups weren't happy with the results of the failed assassination attempt, he tells me, Riley. I'm still on their list. Um... But apart from this, um, the more more intriguing for some of our observers has been his particular decision to join the Likud Party's election campaign. Um, intriguing because for a man who has spent much of his life and nearly sacrificed it fighting to end the status quo on the Temple Mount, opting for the party over whose leader has been determined to preserve Muslim control over the Mount may not seem like the obvious choice. Um... Uh, Let's, let me scroll down here and try to get to the summary here. While many people understandably view Glick through the singular lens of the Temple Mount, um, it is immediately clear that his world view is far more holistic. The struggle for the Temple Mount is not to be taken in isolation. It's an integral part of my Zionism, he explains. Um, Part of my activity in the Temple Mount is about my faith in the nation of Israel and in human rights. I think that the Likud has always been a party of inclusion, a home for every type of Israeli, irrespective of background. Likud is still the national movement to better our nation, and I firmly believe that nothing else comes close. In, my, in his view, stable government is critical for the progress of Israeli society in all aspects of life, including the Temple Mount situation. That's that stability, he insists, is prevented by the multitude of smaller parties, despite their best in intentions. Uh, he notes that regarding the Temple Mount campaign, there are more people who go up from the Laiku than any other party. Some people, sometimes I hear people say, when is the Magat Messiah going to come? So I say to them, what do you mean? He comes around every election. He quips, um, you know, so sad. The Messiah's already come, and he's about to come again. Uh, wow. He said, when I began 25 years ago, we were only a handful of people. Today there are tens of thousands of Jews visiting the Temple Mount. Every day we are advancing a few more steps, a few more centimeters towards a, re a revolution. <clears throat> For now, he is focusing on raising public awareness and building a popular movement and is confident that when Benjamin Netanyahu feels that the people want a change on the Temple Mount, it will be a very different ball game. Um, I, again, I'm going to put this in the description box. It's a really long article. It's worth reading all of it. Uh, he says, uh, I am sure things will change because that's what's right to happen. It must happen. We can't give up. And I'm sure it will change too. I'm sure that there will be a temple on, in Jerusalem because the Bible makes that very, very clear. And because we're coming down to the last days in the beginning of Daniel's 70th week when the when that covenant will be confirmed and the... Uh, temple will be built but again just more and more desire from the jewish people to have access to the temple mount and eventually a temple um a couple more really interesting articles real quick pamela geller exposes america's dirty little secret 22 islamic terror training camps on u.s soil this is out of now the end begins the u.s come on the U.S. has at least 22 Islamist terror training camps hiding in plain sight. These camps are operated by the Pakistan-based group Jamaat al-Fukra and its main U.S. front group, Muslims of the Americas. The reason that Pamela Geller of Atlas Shrugs fame gives these camps being left alone to grow is that the group Jamal al-Fukra is not listed as a terrorist group by the U.S. government. 
and they are reluctant to interfere. You've heard of no-go zones? Well, these camps are those zones. This is Sharia law in action. Are you shocked? Honestly, I'm numb at this point. They have a map on here showing you where all 22 of these are. Um, it says, The Federal Bureau of Investigation documents detailing a 22-site network of terrorist training villages sprawled across the United States, according to the documents. The FBI, is, the FBI has been concerned about these facilities for about 12 years, but cannot act against them because the U.S. State Department has not yet declared their umbrella group, Muslims of the Americas, as a foreign terrorist organization. Geller goes on to say that most of the members of these camps are African Americans who have converted to Islam while doing time in state or federal prison. Prisons have become recruitment and training centers for future jihadists. It is an escalating crisis that is taking its toll as Americans are murdered by those who convert to Islam in prison. The rising influence of Islam in our prisons is due to the disproportionately high number of Muslims who are incarcerated, skyrocketing conversion rates, powerful Muslim gangs, the proliferation of Muslim chaplains, and an uninformed prison power structure, and the outside influence of Islamic terror organizations. Oh, and the fact that the FBI isn't allowed to say Islam, Jihad, or target the very people who are trying to kill us as part of America's dangerous ride. Oh, boy. Uh, so, again, 22 Islamic terror training camps on U.S. soil. Well, Barack Obama won't even use the phrase radical terrorism, Islamic terrorism, or jihad. It says, according to World Net Daily, a 2007 FBI record states that members of the group have been involved in at least 10 murders, one disappearance, three... Three fire bombings, one attempted fire bombing, two explosive bombings, and one attempted bombing. This is members of the uh, the Muslims, what is it? Muslims of Americas. So there you have it, my fellow Americans. Look, look like we are sitting ducks unless something is done about this. It may very well come down to the American people stepping in to save our country unless it's just too late. I believe it's too late. One more article, also out of the Times of Israel. Excuse me, this is out of the Now the End Begins. Another very interesting article about the EU. The EU. It says, Why is the EU Parliament building modeled after the cursed Tower of Babel? The construction of the EU Parliament in the image of the Tower of Babel sends the message that Nimrod had the right philosophy and his Tower of Babel was a good idea. Recently, we've been writing on a particularly interesting character, the new Prime Minister of Greece, Alex Cyprus. Alexis Cyprus. Many Christians are now looking at this man with heightened interest. He seems to embody many of the biblical descriptions of the coming Antichrist. Time will tell. We will be watching. In this article, I will be reporting on something that I find as interesting as Cyprus himself. We will look at the EU Parliament building, and more specifically at their building. Ever since it was completed in December of 1999, the EU Parliament has raised questions and many eyebrows by its peculiar architecture. Although it meant to have a modernist look, many say it was fashioned after Nimrod's Tower of Babel from the Scriptures. Why does it look unfinished? Promoters say it reflects the unfinished nature of Europe. However, some research on the subject reveals the dark and deep symbolism of the building, exposing the real source of inspiration uh, behind the Louis Weiss building is exposed in the esoteric beliefs of the ruled elite, their dark aspirations, and their interpretation of ancient scriptures. We'll go straight to the point. The building is meant to look like a painting of the Tower of Babel. Um, and the story says that the Tower of Babel was never completed. So the UN parliamentary is basically continuing the unfinished work of Nimrod, the infamous tyrant who was building the Tower of Babel to defy God. Do you think this is a good source of information, inspiration from a, for a democratic constitu institution? Um, the Bible tells us that there was worldwide unity and harmony. A good thing, right? Wrong. In fact, Genesis 11.1 1 says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. No sooner is the whole world together than they immediately plan to overthrow God and build a tower to heaven. And that's the result of bringing in world peace without the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. We all know the story. The Tower of Babel, uh, the, we all know the story. Uh, they build the tower, make some pretty good progress, right up until the moment where God confounds their speech with the multiplicity of 
previously unknown languages, and they are scattered. It looks like the modern-day European Union is headed for the same exact fate. The official motto of the European Parliament is this, Europe, many tongues, one voice. Now add to their model that their official headquarters is an updated version of the Tower of Babel, and I think you begin to see not only the motive, but intent as well. Symbolism of the EU Parliament. The construction of the EU Parliament is in the image of the Tower of Babel sends the message that Nimrod had the right philosophy and his Tower of Babel was a good idea. What we can expect to see from the EU on this path, a gradual introduction to tyranny, the elimination of worship of God to introduce dependence on power, all people speaking the same language and the same religion, rejecting God while trying to become gods. You know what? Those who are major precepts of the esoteric beliefs of the world elite. Their belief system is based on a mystery, uh, on the mystery religions, uh, pagan rituals, worship of the sun, considering Lucifer as the one who gave light to the human race, seeing God as a force, wanting to keep humans in the dark. Their new world order will have evacuated all worship of God, introduced a single language, and changed democracy to tyranny. And then they show the official poster promoting the EU Parliament. And uh, it says, uh, it reminds me of the movie Jurassic Park where they use DNA samples to recreate uh, ancient dinosaurs only to find themselves as the prey of those animals. Amazing how history repeats itself and how Bible prophecy is always correct every single time. Um, It goes on to talk about, we have a confirmation that the building was truly inspired by the Tower of Babel, by this poster, and the poster is recreated. It's actually It actually is a poster of the Tower of Babel. And then, um, so then uh, it goes down, point two, the slogan, Europe, many tongues, one voice, refers to God, confusing the people with many languages. Uh, lesson learned since Genesis 11, 0. Point three, look closely at the stars at the top. Do they look strange? They are upside down. Reversed pentagrams. The symbolism behind pentagrams is extremely deep and complex, but we can say that a regular pentagram refers to good ruling and a reverse pentagram refers to evil ruling. This poster has been, has been banned due to protests by numerous groups. In conclusion, the European Union is a super state that currently includes 28 countries more in the future. The same fate awaits American and Asian countries who are bound to unite under the same flag and currency to create other superstates. Those are the building blocks toward a single world government, a goal actively sought by the world elite. The EU Parliament building is the first monument representing a superstate and reveals through its intense symbolism, hatred of religion, of religion, plans for a new world order, and their subtle endorsement of tyranny. Are you convinced of the demonic powers at work here as I am? Well, this new information in hand, with this new information in hand, the Alexis Cypress piece now is even more intriguing, intriguing wouldn't you say? Well, what I can say is, uh, again, just more evidence of the preparations for the one world government. And Pope Francis has been working very hard on preparations for the one world religion. The United Nations, the, of course, the Obama administration, and the European Union all working toward global harmony and peace through one world government. It is so important to know for sure if you are saved. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He came to earth the first time to suffer and die for you. Shed his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. But Jesus Christ will save you if you ask him through his shed blood, faith in his death and resurrection. He will make you a new creature in Christ. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Call out to him in faith, and he will save you. But you are running out of time. All the signs are here. He's returning soon. Make sure you're ready. And keep looking up. God bless everyone.